Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Dan Sampeo and I'm delighted to open today's Mondap webinar in association with Kaitan & Co discussing recent changes in India's advertising laws and regulation. Your moderator for today's session is Samir Saar, who will introduce you to the panel. But before I hand over to them, a housekeeping item. You are able to submit questions to today's panel by typing them into the questions pane of the toolbar on the right hand side of your page. The panel will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible, but please do get in touch after the webinar for any additional information or if your question isn't answered. It's now my pleasure to hand you over to Samir to begin. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Samir Shah and I'm a partner in Khaitan's Corporate m &A Practice Group. I will be your moderator for today. Welcome to our webinar. Our topic for today's webinar is, are you ready for India's new advertising laws? And thank you for taking the time to be with us. On our next slide is the agenda for today's webinar. In summary, we will have a presentation from two partners of Khaitan and Company, specializing in advertising laws, followed by a panel discussion, and then a Q&A session with audience questions. As Dan mentioned, please submit your questions using the facility provided in the webinar portal. If we cannot cover all questions during the webinar, we will respond offline by email after the webinar. We will also send a copy of the presentation and the recording afterwards. With that, I would like to take a moment to introduce our panel today. We have a wonderful panel which includes stakeholders in advertising who bring very different perspectives. First up, we have Mr. Subhash Kamath. Subhash is a very highly regarded veteran of the advertising industry. He has been a chief executive of leading advertising companies such as BBH and Publicis. Also, he recently retired as the chairman of the Advertising Standards Council of India. We also have with us Ms. Manisha Kapoor, who is at the forefront of advertising industry regulation, and she is the Secretary General and CEO of the Advertising Standards Council of India. Manisha also happens to be the Vice President of the International Council for Advertising Self-Regulation. We then have Mr. Rishi Gautam, who is the Global General Counsel of Tata Consumer Products. He is our third industry guest. Tata Consumer Products is a leading FMCG company in India, manufacturing and supplying consumer products not only in India, but in 200 countries worldwide. And it is a member of the famous Tata Group conglomerate. Finally, we have two partners from Khaitan and Company who specialize in advertising laws. The first is my partner, Nishad Natkarni, who is an intellectual property practitioner. He brings extensive advisory and litigation experience in advertising laws and comparative advertising disputes. Our second partner, Tanu Banerjee, is a TMT specialist with considerable expertise and experience advising on advertising regulations. So without further ado, I ask Nishad and Tanu to provide a brief presentation on advertising laws in India to provide context for our panel discussion. Over to you, Nishad and Tanu. Thank you. Thank you, Sami. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? And the next, please. Thank you. So uh, a very good day to all our viewers. So Tanu and I will provide you brief insights on the self-regulatory mechanism, a uh, gist of the various legislations that could be applicable, a background of the Consumer Protection Act, and some guidelines which have been framed in the context of advertisements. Can we have the next slide, please? So in India, there has been a dual regulatory regime when it comes to advertising. On one hand, there is self-regulatory mechanism, which is well-developed and focused on advertising. And then there is a complex statutory framework. As regards the statutory framework, there has been no single all-encompassing statute for regulating advertisements. There have been various statutes which either relate to specific sectors or then relate to specific media. So whilst planning advertisements, it is essential to not only factor general regulations that apply to advertisements, but also provisions which are scattered in different product specific statutes. 
As regards comparative advertising, the law has developed mostly through judicial proceedings. Now let's first have a look at the self-regulatory regime. Can we have the next slide, please? So one of the most prevalent form of regulation of advertisements in India has been a strong self-regulatory regime. Can we change that slide, please? Which has been administered by the self-regulatory organization known as the Advertising Standards Council of India, also known as ASCII. This was formed in 1985. It's not a statutory body, nor is it a judicial body, but it's an independent organization. So ASCII over a period of time has developed an exhaustive code known as the ASCII code. This not only sets out the basic parameters relating to advertisements, but also guidelines for content of advertisements, such as disclaimers, mention of awards, use of children, depiction of gender stereotypes, and the do's and don'ts with regard to the same. Now, it contains sector spe specific guidelines also for uh, the automotive sector, the food and beverages sector, education, etc. Recently, it has come up with guidelines for endorsers and celebrities and also for virtual digital assets, which are currently the rage. Now, Tanu will deal later with some of these guidelines. Now, most advertising agencies, manufacturers, service providers are members of ASCII. And consumers, consumer associations, or industry members can file complaints against any advertisement. Similarly, ASCII can also sue or to initiate complaints against objectionable advertisements. The code provides for an exhaustive mechanism to deal with these complaints. A preliminary period is provided for voluntarily complying with uh, the anomalies with uh, regard to the objections in the advertisement. Then there is a period for justifying the advertisement. If necessary, there is a technical experts panel which helps with technical claims. The complaint is then considered by a consumer complaints council which comprises of industry specialists as well as professional advisors. Decisions or recommendations of ASCII are then given. These decisions are not judgments, but are normally respected and complied with by advertisers. The statistics suggest that 80% are normally complied with. Now, if you have an objection to the recommendation, there is an independent review panel, which is headed by a retired judge of the Bombay High Court. Now, since ASCII is not a judicial body, the recommendations or decisions do not have the force of enforceable judgments. But in case these are not complied with, ASCII from time to time also forwards these recommendations to the relevant regulators so that action may be taken if necessary. We would be discussing some nuances of this later. Can you have the next slide, please? Now, coming to the statutory framework, it is spread out in different statutes. These statutes do not per se relate to advertisements, but relate to regulation of specific products or services. Now, some provisions of these statutes relate to advertising also. More generally, the Indian Penal Code, which is the principal criminal law, maps out offenses and punishments for the same. It prohibits hurting of religious sentiments, obscenity, defamation, etc. The Information Technology Act, which is the primary legislation governing digital space, prohibits dissemination of any sexually explicit content that depicts children. When it comes to regulation relating to media, there is the Cable Television Act and the rules under that. These rules specifically require advertisements to comply with the ASCII code. Speaking of, uh, speaking of specific products, uh, there is the Cigarettes and Tobacco Products Prohibition uh, of Advertising Act, which prohibits advertising of tobacco. For drugs and cosmetics, there's the Drugs and Cosmetics Act and the Drugs and Magical Remedies Act. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, let's look at a statute which deals more specifically with advertisements, the Consumer Protection Act. It is now one of the principal statutes which governs, the, uh, governs and regulates advertisements. Earlier, the consumer protection statute was relevant principally in the context of consumer disputes arising out of defective goods or deficiency in services. And these were tried before the consumer forum, which is constituted under the statute. The statute also sought to prevent unfair trade practices, which was broadly defined, though litigation in that space was not so much. In 2019, the statute was revamped substantially and several new aspects were introduced. 
the new act came into effect in july 2020 now with the revised statute several changes were implemented into the construct of the consumer protection act which now provides also for the basic framework for advertising basic uh, regulation now two significant aspects introduced into the statute which we would be discussing today would be the introduction of the concept of misleading advertisements and the formation of the consumer protection authority the central consumer protection authority to regulate advertising the act also introduces penalties and punishments including an imprisonment up to five years for issuing misleading advertisements we would be discussing the impact of these later in the session as well the consumer protection authority better known as the ccpa has been formed to regulate matters relating to consumer interest unfair trade practice and also false or misleading advertisements now the authority is located in delhi and has very wide powers it can initiate proceedings so motto or on the basis of complaints it can investigate acts which affect consumer interest or then refer such matters for investigation to specific regulators or the consumer court it also has the ability to undertake research in respect of consumer protection and also undertake activities to spread awareness and yes it also has the power to frame and issue regulations to protect consumer interest i'll pass the handle now to tanu to deal with some of these recent guidelines and few sector specific guidelines over to you tanu Sorry, Tanu, I think that you may be on mute at the moment. We should be able to hear you now, Tanu. Thank you. My apologies, Tanu. It looks like your mic may not be working. I don't know, Nishad, if you are able to pick up at this point just whilst we get Tanu working. And I think that you're muted at the moment, yeah, Nishad. Apologies. Great. Tanu, I think that your mic is working. Thank you very much and my apologies for the inconvenience. All right, great. Uh, my apologies as well. Uh, good evening to everyone who's joined us today. Uh, uh, now, just as Nishad explained, uh, amongst the various powers that the Central Consumer Protection uh, Authority has under the Consumer Protection Act, uh, it also has the power to issue guidelines to prevent misleading advertising uh, and protect consumer interests. Basis these powers, under, uh, earlier this year, it issued uh, the guidelines for prevention of misleading advertising and endorsements. Uh, since these have been issued under an existing statute, which is the Consumer Protection Act, which enables CCPA to issue such guidelines, even though they are called guidelines as opposed to rules or regulations, they actually have statutory force uh, in India. We'll talk a little about what these apply to all advertisements regardless of form format uh, or medium and not only to advertisers but also to advertising agencies or endorsers who are helping create ads they lay down a broad regulatory framework for advertising uh, including what does not constitute misleading advertisements uh, essentially it says that ads should contain honest representations and should not exaggerate a product or a service um, and they shouldn't also downplay the risks involved in a particular product uh, or, uh, or a service. There are also some principles to regulate bait advertisements and free claim advertisements. Uh, now, bait advertisements are those uh, where products are offered at a low cost uh, as a bait to consumers. And free claim advertisements are those where free products or features are offered. The guidelines say that if such ads are published, then manufacturers must ensure that the products are actually available uh, as advertised. And once a demand for this product is created based on the ad, the manufacturer should be able to actually meet the demand as well. 
Uh, we'll next talk about surrogate advertisements, which is uh, a significant concept uh, under the guidelines. Uh, surrogate advertising basically means indirect advertisements of prohibited products. Uh, these could be alcohol, tobacco, cigarettes, etc. Um, although the brand that is used for these prohibited products can be used for other products which are not in the prohibited sector, uh, uh, so long as the guidelines are not violated. This concept is often referred to as brand extension as well. Uh, for example, many alcohol companies, uh, while they can't advertise uh, alcohol directly, but they use brands uh, on merchandise like caps um, or beer mugs or stationery, etc., uh, which helps them to increase the visibility of the brand. In fact, there are parameters that need to be met while uh, selling such brand extension products as well. Uh, next, the guidelines also speak about the responsibilities of endorsers and celebrities. We'll talk about this a little more uh, in detail in the next slide. Uh, use of children in advertisements uh, in ways that would encourage dangerous behavior uh, or which could improperly impact uh, them is prohibited entirely. Uh, other than that, we would have noticed that often ads contain different sort of disclaimers. Um, so in, in respect of disclaimers, the guidelines specify some rules on language, font, placement, uh, etc. of the disclaimers into the ads. If you could please move to the next slide. Now, from what we've discussed so far, uh, you would have gathered that advertising regulations in India are spread across various legislations and uh, regulations um, and are administered by two parallel bodies, one being ASCII, which is a voluntary organization, and the other being the CCPA, which is a statutory body. An added layer to this, is that apart from the framework of ASCII and Consumer Protection Act, there are also some sector-specific mandates, which are again spread across guidelines, advisories, and legislations issued by uh, different regulatory bodies in India. Of course, it's difficult for us to cover all sectors in this session, but we will try and cover three, se uh, three sectors which have grown massively in India in recent times, um, and therefore from a market perspective are quite relevant at present. First, here we'll talk about the framework on influencer uh, uh, advertising or celebrity-led advertising. These are relevant for influencers themselves, but uh, also for advertisers engaging the celebrity or the influencer to uh, endorse their product or service. Endorsements in general are governed by both the consumer protection regime and also the ASCII guidelines. Both of these regimes have overlapping provisions. Uh, essentially, they require that there should be disclosures of any material connection between the advertiser and the, uh, and the endorser. Um, effectively, it means that ads that are created by influencers uh, should be tagged as sponsored or paid promotions or you know, some similar disclosure in, in this regard. Uh, secondly, the endorser should have undertaken some due diligence by itself on the product or the service that they are promoting. Now, obviously, this overall puts significant onus on the endorser itself uh, in terms of promotional posts and ads, uh, but also on the advertiser to make sure that the disclosures are uh, appropriately placed. The second sector we'll talk about is the online gaming sector. Now, this is a favorite because the regulatory regime uh, for gaming in India is, is as exciting as gaming itself. Um, gaming is a state-specific subject in India which means that each Indian state can have its own laws to uh, govern online gaming. And we have 29 states and all. Uh, betting and gambling are illegal in most parts of India. This is because of the general principle, any game that is purely based on chance is considered as gambling and therefore it's illegal. Uh, and a game of skill, even if it is played with monetary stakes, is considered legal. For overall online gaming, ASCII had prescribed some guidelines. Um, in effect, uh, essentially, they require disclaimers to be added uh, in ads for games where real money gaming, uh, real money stakes are involved uh, or where there could be a financial risk to gamers. Now, other than the ASCII guidelines and the various state legislations on gaming, uh, just a few uh, months ago this year, the Ministry of Broadcasting in India also issued advisories uh, restricting uh, ads for online betting platforms across TV channels, digital platforms, and print media. 
Lastly, we'll talk about advertising of crypto products. Now, uh, for a bit of background on cryptocurrencies in India, in 2018, the Reserve Bank of India, which is our central bank, prohibited Indian banks and financial sector entities from dealing with any entity uh, that dealt with cryptocurrencies. Now, this prohibition practically banned cryptocurrencies in India. Um, although in 2019, the Supreme Court of India overruled this ban. But of course, uh, no one wanted to miss out on, uh, on crypto investments uh, just because the Indian government was skeptical. Uh, so people continued to invest in these assets and uh, cryptocurrency and NFT based businesses continued growing in India. Uh, considering this, ASCII published its uh, guidelines for advertising on virtual digital assets and services. The guidelines require that ads uh, of, of, of any cryptocurrency or NFT should carry a risk disclaimer, uh, which essentially says that crypto products and NFTs are unregulated and can be highly risky. Um, and there may be no regulatory recourse for any loss from such transactions. There are also some directions on the manner and placement of the disclaimer and ads across different mediums. Um, the other point being that uh, ads, these ads should not guarantee any profits um, and they should not draw any comparison to regulated uh, financial products or assets. So as an overall takeaway from our uh, discussion so far, uh, in India, advertising regulations are spread across various regulatory and statutory regimes. Um, and while ASCII and CCP are two most prominent authorities administering the advertising industry, depending on the business or product of the advertiser or, the, or even the manner in which the ad is created, uh, there could be other regulators uh, and legislations to refer to as well. Uh, so for an advertiser, it's necessary to understand not only the framework uh, under ASCII or the Consumer Protection Act, uh, but in fact to also be advised on any other legislations that may apply. Uh, these could be legislations that apply to a specific product or uh, even a specific business sector. Uh, with this, I'd like to wrap up our first segment for this session. Uh, back to you, Sami. Thank you very much, Tanwin Nishad. That was a very crisp and thought-provoking uh, presentation. And what an excellent segue into our next uh, segment, which is the panel discussion. Uh, let us give you a moment to grab your breath. Please grab a sip of water. I'll request all our panelists to uh, put their cameras on. And Aaron, if I can request you to take the slide deck off. Excellent, thank you. So we're just lovely. So we have everybody. So like I said, why don't we give Tanwa and Nishad a break? And perhaps Manisha, we could start with you. Um, so just in terms of the ASCI code, I think Nishad gave a very quick overview, but you're really it. So if, if you can give us a sense on how does it practically work in terms of process? Uh, is it the advertisers who would take recourse? Would it be the consumers or, or how would that function? Tanwa and Nishad, sorry, maybe your cameras can also come back. Yeah, hi, hi, Samir. Um, so essentially, ASCII looks at uh, four kinds of objectionable advertisements. So we look at misleading advertisements, uh, which is also what the CCPA covers. Uh, but besides this, we also look at three other categories of uh, objectionable ads. Um, so we look at ads uh, that could be indecent or vulgar. Uh, we look at ads that could be harmful, uh, particularly to vulnerable population, uh, you know, like children. Uh, and uh, we also have ads, uh, you know, uh, so, so we also require ads to be fair in competition. Um, so that's, you know, another category of ads that uh, we look at. Uh, so this is uh, predominantly the code and, um, uh, you know, the way that uh, our code is structured. And then, of course, as you mentioned, we have several category related uh, guidelines as well that fall under one of these main chapters, uh, you know, at kind of interpreting that chapter for uh, different uh, sectors. Uh, we receive complaints from the public. Uh, we can receive complaints from the government. We can receive complaints from uh, advertisers or competitors or so, you know, people from the industry. Uh, we can receive complaints from consumer bodies. So pretty much anyone um, you know, can uh, register a complaint uh, with ASCII. Uh, it's free of cost for anyone that registers uh, a complaint. And uh, you know, so, so that's what uh, our, our membership funding kind of goes towards is to set up this grievance system 
um, and uh, you know once a complaint comes in as um, I think the shall also briefly outlined uh, in, in some cases we just get uh, you know a resolution immediately from the advertiser uh, but in some cases this needs to be investigated further um, and uh, you know based on uh, I think the uh, criteria that uh, kind of comes in um, uh, you know, we, we take further uh, action uh, based on what's, uh, uh, you know, what, what the actual grievance is. Understood, understood. So I think I, I grabbed two points from there and maybe I'll circle back to you on one. You said that there's a little bit of an overlap. I think we should come back to that. But maybe if I go to Subhash. So Subhash, Nishad sort of outlined the process. I think Manisha gave us further depth. With this already there, was there really a need for the CCP? I mean, why this legislative intervention at all in the context of false and misleading advertising? Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at if you look at uh, any of the established markets across the world, whether it's the US, whether it's Europe or anywhere else, you'll realize that self-regulation works within the law, right? It works in partnership with the sector regulator in any of the established markets, right? Uh, we we are a self-regulatory body which means our members who have signed up have signed up have taken the pledge to follow a certain path of and not to cross a certain line right uh however being a self-regulatory body it also means that <clears throat> in case of non-compliance <clears throat> enforceability becomes an issue with the sector regulator who's the ultimate law in the country uh enforcing it then it arms it gives it gives teeth to any regulation that we may be talking about right uh happily and and so is the case in india we've been in very very close touch uh with with uh, doka we've been in very close touch with mib and many other government uh, divisions for precisely this reason right the first i mean being a creative industry the first call the port of call has to be the self-regulator because it is much faster it is also educated by experts who understand creativity what line should not be crossed what is permissible so on, what is uh, creative exaggeration but what is misleading and so on and so forth right uh, we can we can we can uh, we can judge these things much faster than a court of law and therefore if there is and happily uh, we've enjoyed almost 95 97 percent compliance from our members uh, within two weeks of a complaint coming in so so that's a good place to be but in cases where there is a non-compliance or there is a misunderstanding or a lack of understanding which happens sometimes in in very new new age categories then the best thing is to do is to have your actual sector regulator as the partner right and that's the way we see it uh, i think it is very welcome uh, that that the consumer protection act has become so active now because it, it really gives marketeers something to think about you have to be responsible and i've always said this in all my interviews with with great creative power comes great responsibility so when you want to go and create that imagery for your brand uh, there is a responsibility that lies on you and on your endorser right that you can't cross and and uh, so as long as you are keeping that in mind uh, and wherever there is a extreme case of or or, or a simple case of non-compliance now we know whom to take it to great so maybe we take that spider-man analogy and manisha i'll come back to you so uh, ascii has a web ccpa has a web where do these webs overlap how do they intersect what's what's your thought process yeah, but we, we, are, we are the friendly neighborhood spider-man okay we are the friendly neighborhood <laughs> yeah so i think uh, to the extent that you know uh, you know both of us are looking at misleading ads uh, i think that's really where the overlap is uh, as you mentioned uh, you know ccpa uh, and the consumer authorities and and you know, the consumer protection act uh, you know advertising is only one part of it uh, there are several other ways in which they look at consumer protection so it's in that sense a larger mandate um, you know, which is which includes product deficiencies, service deficiencies, uh, a lot of other issues uh, surrounding um, consumer protection. ASCII's remit is sharply focused on advertising, uh, and we look at, like I mentioned, advertising that goes uh, beyond misleading ads. Though that that does form a bulk of uh, what we look at, but we look at objections of other kinds as well. But other thing to remember is again, I, I think as Subhash mentioned. 
you know, both regulation and self-regulation have complementary roles. Uh, you know, being the first port of call, um, you know, things to remember is that self-regulation does not cost the taxpayer anything. Okay, it is a quick mechanism uh, of grievance handling, which is fixed by the industry. Uh, our complaints are sorted out in days and weeks uh, where the consumer gets a resolution. Um, so I think those become some of the advantages uh, of self-regulation. We are much more agile. Um, you know, you've seen uh, regulate or self-regulatory guidelines that we've brought in for crypto, for gaming, for influencers. Uh, you know, pretty much as these categories emerge and evolve in the market. So, you know, the code can be much more agile and responsive uh, to market conditions. We, we've just released a report today on dark patterns and, you know, how, how that protects consumers and what are the challenges and vulnerabilities over there. So I think there are advantages to self-regulation, which is low cost, speedy, agile, responsive, up to date. Uh, you know, those become the advantages. Uh, ASCII also has the advantage of, uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, being a part of the Cable TV Act um, and therefore also has, uh, you know, a kind of legal backing on, on certain platforms. Uh, our compliance rate, just the voluntary compliance rate is extremely high. And I think even globally, you know, advertising self-regulation is one of the most successful forms of self-regulation. Uh, the law, of course, comes in with, uh, you know, the enforcement uh, ability. Uh, and I think that provides a great uh, context uh, and a great, uh, uh, you know, incentive for people to regulate themselves. Um, so, so I think that works in very complementary ways. Um, as Subhash said, we are in constant touch uh, with the Ministry of Consumer Affairs, with the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting on issues that are of concern for both of us. I mean, you know, the agenda is... Uh, there's, there's a big overlap in the agenda and, uh, uh, you know, so so we kind of work pretty closely with the government on, on certain matters. Great. So I think let's move from the regulator to the regulated. I mean, Rishi has been very patiently waiting. So Rishi, you know, love to hear your perspectives on how are advertisers like yourselves coping with these changes. And I mean, the, the operative word is risk. How do you manage the risks in relation to false and misleading advertising as an advertiser? Okay, hi, hi everyone. So I, before I start, I must um, say, I mean, we as industry endorse everything what Manisha has said. And if I may add, uh, this new regulation is in place. The new regulator is there. All that we are expecting is that this amazing, if I may use the word jurisprudence that ASCII has developed and evolved over the years. If the regulator sort of takes cognizance of this, again, I would use the word jurisprudence and bear with me here. It's it's, it's entire sort of the, the thought process, the thinking, the agility, the fact that we as members of ASCII have always sort of, uh, so, so, so how, how it works for us is that we have a system in place, fine tuned over a number of years. We also, we are, we are food and beverages. So we are also regulated by the our sector regulator. And very often the situation is that a claim under um, the claim is pro probably being prosecuted by the sector regulator as well. And uh, ASCII also looks at that, looks at it. So we have evolved this framework. We have a matrix for escalation within the organization, and we do provide that kind of training. And when these new regulations came, one of the fears that we had was, are we going to start with scratch or is the sector regulator going to rely upon what has already been developed? So my request, I mean, I don't know whom I'm requesting to, but my request is if the sector regulator sort of works more closely with ASCII, understands their thought process, learns from their experiences, it will <laughs> sort of, what it does is that for industry, people who play by the rules, people who are willing to play by the rules, it makes life easier for us, as well as sort of, sort of uh, um, uh, picks up the, if I may use the word, the rotten apples faster. Uh, so far, we have not had any experience with under the new rules, the new authority have had no brush with them. Um, uh, but look again, as I, I would say, uh, we have again the example that she gave was this this sort of dark patterns. So things like those, it will take time for the regulator to catch up to those practices, then the rules to come out. But what ASCII does very brilliantly is evolves the thought process, gets the industry consensus looks after the interests of the stakeholders and the consumers and all gives a solution which is already in place. So we are quite sort of hopeful that the regulator will look at what, what is there already and sort of 
complement their role rather than uh, uh, sort of uh, having a divergent path loud and clear rishi and whoever hasn't heard it we'll ensure your voice travels to them so uh leave that with us i think that's one for us to take care of so maybe why don't we do this so we've heard the we've heard the regulator and the regulated perspective tanu how about we get into a little bit of detail so you spoke about the ccpa guidelines uh drill it down a little bit what's really what is really this misleading advertise advertising concept and when is when does an advertisement actually become misleading under the new rules yeah so some really you know uh, just the way it sounds you know anything which is uh, falsely describing a product so you know any ad that is inaccurately describing a product or a service or let's say it gives a false guarantee of uh, the ability or functionality of the product um, or let's say it's deliberately concealing uh, you know something which is important for the consumer to know all of these things can can uh, become misleading uh, at uh, in that sense so uh, let's say what uh, can be deemed as misleading the fundamental principle is that the ad should basically be a honest and truthful representation of the product or the service that's being advertised um and i must add here that uh, the consumer protection act in fact places quite a high threshold of diligence on advertisers on this account uh um, so it doesn't take into account the intent with which the ad has been created uh the fundamental principle is that the representation uh in the ad should be not misleading and it should be accurate uh to the product other things like it should not exaggerate the functionality it should not exaggerate the benefits um it should be based on um, you know let's say there are some claims in the in the advertisement uh several ad you know we will see several ads uh, use superlative expressions uh for the product or the service you know saying that okay this is best of so and so in the market etc so these sort of claims should be basically backed uh by some research uh backed scientifically um and then lastly of course uh, you know if the product is in a certain sector and that sector has uh you know guidelines or uh laws to comply with then your advertisement should also be aligned to that uh you know that's that's the summary of it uh, but of course uh, you know these are detailed uh, points and every ad in that sense every advertiser should take some diligence that you know they are within the guidelines and i think the the consumer protection regime and and the ccpa guidelines that have come in uh, they're quite helpful in in that sense so just some reference to that uh, would also give a fair bit of indication to an advertiser Great. Sorry, I was furiously typing away because the number of questions are unmanageable. Aaron and I are having to work through those. But nonetheless, I will hang on to the word diligence. It's given me an idea for a question that I go back to Manisha with. But before that, I, I was scribbling some notes, and Nisha, uh, it will be helpful to get your perspective. So Tanu's just explained where misleading advertisements are heading. Um, is this something which is open to a class action, or should it only uh, under the CPA, or will it only be open to individual complaints? yeah so th this is a very good question i think you know uh, so uh, when you are speaking of the consumer protection act even prior to the amendment complainants were defined quite broadly under the consumer protection act now this definition not only includes individual consumers <clears throat> but also a set of consumers having a common interest or for that matter consumer associations so class actions as we understand them uh, to be in the sense that where uh, a set of people have a common interest vis-a-vis -vis a common defendant so to say would these be uh, identified by the statute and encompassed in the statute the answer is yes now in so far as misleading advertisements are concerned as i indicated to you uh, that's a slightly more recent introduction into the statute right and until now the class actions have been tested in the context of defective goods deficiency in services and those kind of traditional consumer disputes so just to give you an example when you talk about uh, a builder selling houses there are a class of purchasers within the same premise right 
and if there are false uh, representations made in the course of rendering the services of uh, the real estate service then these buyers have come together and initiated action before the consumer forum there has been litigation around it as to the maintainability of the statute and there has been a national consumer uh, court decision and the supreme court decision which indicated that you know these class actions are maintainable in the context of uh, the CCPA and misleading advertisements, however, it's not yet tested. Uh, but I have no reason to believe why these actions should not be maintainable and uh, why they should not uh, be actioned by either the courts or the CCPA. And of course, in terms of uh, what can be the result of such actions, they would be very similar to what it would be for normal consumer actions. So uh, there would be a direction to uh, remove uh, any objectionable claims, rectify those claims, or maybe just take down the advertisement. And then, of course, you have the penal uh, remedies and uh, in terms of penalties and imprisonment also, which have now been introduced uh, for repeat offenses or the first offense as well. So that would really depend upon the nature of the advertisement, the nature of the claim, etc. So maybe we just go back to Tanu and uh, Tanu, perhaps you can pick up from where Nishad left off. Uh, can you give our audience a sense of what are the financial penalties or fines under the CCPA? And are they meaningful enough to, to cause a dent or will it just be something that is brushed off and, and forgotten? Yeah, very uh, interesting question again, uh, Samir. Um, so I think I'll start with saying that, look, CCPA, uh, you know, we discussed that it's a statutory body now, and it's not as if it's not being taken seriously. The industry is taking it seriously. And I think Subhash, uh, you know, very rightly mentioned that uh, generally a self-regulatory regime also works within a framework. And, you know, that framework comes with CCPA as a statutory body. So one is that, of course, it's, it's a serious uh, sort of industry body. Um, in terms of specific fines and penalties, uh, you know, there could be monetary fines and there could also be imprisonment. Uh, now, fines range between, uh, you know, 10 lakhs to 50 lakhs rupees, which could be roughly around, um, I think, 12,000 US dollars to 60,000 US dollars at the outer uh, side, uh, which in some sense may not be very substantial. But I think the deterrent is that there is also, the act also prescribes imprisonment. Typically, we've not uh, seen sentencing in you know, these sort of matters. Uh, but then, you know, there is a provision for that, and, and that can't be. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's point number one. Uh, the other is, uh, again, for endorsers, for example, this was for advertisers, but uh, endorsers, there's a different sort of penalty. Uh, they could be barred for endorsing uh, for, a, for a period of time. Um, and I think if you look at it from an endorser's perspective, uh, brand endorsements are one of the most lucrative opportunities for them. So to be barred altogether from endorsing is, is quite a deterrent, even if the financial penalties are not substantial. Um, so that's, you know, that's second. And I think overall, I'll wrap it up with saying that whatever the financial penalties may be for an advertiser or a huge corporate uh, or even, a, you know, let's say a really big celebrity or a star, uh, it's possible that they could afford the financial penalties, and it's possible to say that it's not substantial. But imagine the reputational dent that it will cause, um, right? And and I think that for uh, especially in the context of branding, uh, right? I think that is a bigger detriment uh, than really just financial penalties. So the way to look at it is, um, yes, there is provisions for adequate fines, uh, imprisonment, and you know other remedies. Uh, but any advertiser or endorser in this space would uh, definitely be very concerned about the reputational risk that it could cause to the brand. So we have an advertiser in the room. And before I go back to him, Nishad, can you help us just assess under the CCPA has some action already happened? Do we have precedents available or is it all still raw and untested? Sorry, was on mute. Yeah, so the CCPA is a new introduction. Yes, uh, it's just been uh, introduced during the course of the pandemic, so to say. And uh, yes, it has been very active. Uh, there's been a good amount of uh, 
action which has been taken. Uh, CCPA has been issuing a lot of uh, notices, uh, Siomoto. A lot, many of them, uh, as you would guess, were in the context of uh, claims which were related to the COVID pandemic. And it was not only, um, and okay, so since medicines are not really uh, capable of being advertised, uh, the question is what were these claims in respect of? So these claims were in respect of almost anything that you could purchase. They could be air conditioners, uh, which, you know, filter air so as to reduce the virus uh, in content in the air, or it could be plywood with coatings, which would uh, prevent the infection of COVID or which would kill the virus, etc. So a lot of these uh, manufacturers have been issued notices in the course of uh, the life of the CCPA so far. Uh, CCPA has, uh, in certain cases, imposed fines. In certain cases, the advertisers themselves have withdrawn the advertisements. In certain cases, there have been a modification of claims or a restriction of the claim. Um, and, uh, you know, those advertisements have continued. Uh, more recently, uh, moving slightly away from the COVID pandemic, there was a FMCG brand which was pulled up with regard to certain claims which were made with re respect to a product. I will not go into the details of the product, etc. But uh, ultimately, the discontinuation of the advertisement was uh, called upon. Uh, and uh, another complaint which uh, I recollect is in relation to a telemarketing and e-commerce website uh, with regard to misleading of consumers regarding information on inventory and production of goods. I think a fine of about 10 lakh rupees was uh, imposed. Uh, as regards the procedure, the procedure is still a little fluid. There are no fixed formats for complaints or responses, etc. Uh, similar to the ASCII, where you know uh, legal representation is not permitted, it is not clear yet whether uh, lawyers can present the cases before CCPA. We have seen both things happen. Uh, certain members permit legal representation. Certain members permit. Uh, accompaniment by legal representatives but the companies have to make uh, the representation before the ccpa they may be assisted by uh, external lawyers so that's uh, the not so brief answer to that understood understood so uh good i, I don't i don't think the idea is to square to scare our audience so i guess rishi i i need your help uh both uh, tanu and nishad have obviously made it clear that the new guidelines have teeth, those teeth, the animal bites, uh, and the bite can be a little dangerous. So uh, just from your perspective, again, as an advertiser, what is it that you'd like, uh, for example, to be clarified, uh, either in relation to the new legislation or in relation to ASCI? Uh, what is your wish list? Absolutely. There are a few things I think Tanu has already hinted towards there is requirement of clarity. But before I move on to those, I would just like to add to what Tanu was talking about in terms of whether reputational damage is sufficient. So for some advertisers, especially large listed organizations, increasingly we are, not increasingly, it's now a statutory requirement for especially global corporations about our ESG responsibility. And as, as far as I am concerned, I view uh, I mean, yes, there is an advertisement sort of thing going on parallelly. My marketing people and, and, and the business side takes care of it. But for me, um, a notice from ASCII, a notice from FSSAI, pulling us up for an advertisement which uh, can be viewed as we not fulfilling our ESG requirements, especially towards children, nutrition, uh, social responsibility, gender stereotyping. I would take it quite seriously so more than just a financial uh, sort of a thing or even the risk of imprisonment it is the esg linkage for which for at least for some of us is becoming increasingly important our reputations i mean matter uh, a lot there uh, but uh, coming back to your question um, as you have already mentioned for some of us like in fmcg sector we have a sector regulator we have consumer protection fssai we have the consumer protection guidelines we are already subject to ASCII as a member. So I think at some stage, a consolidation is what 
people should or, or, i don't know who uh, i mean maybe it, it, maybe it's a thing it's an ongoing process which we should think about but a consolidation of uh, uh, so that at least there is clarity in terms of uh, uh, who governs what aspect and sort of uh, makes it more streamlined i'm not saying that it is not streamlined i know ascii will not look at matters which are already subject to fssci and those sorts of things but even within fssci and the new regulator is this i think the jurisprudence will evolve on that similarly more clarity required there's more clarity requirement on targeted advertisements uh, tanu had briefly mentioned about uh, brand extensions I, I can already see a question coming on brand extension and surrogates not from alcohol sector but from pharma sector i think you should you should look, you should probably answer that and uh, yes i mean gaming um, um, other sort of cryptocurrencies new age businesses the time is that we need clarity on each one of these things i think i think, I think that's a very that's a good list and been making notes and we'll, we'll obviously pick up on this but i still haven't forgotten the words due diligence and and manisha i think we need your help here just to um, so we now know what the advertisers want uh, but the question really is how do they avoid a rap on the knuckles and and as rishi has put it uh, there'll be a lot of your members who will be holier than thou who will not want even the slightest of uh, slippages to take place what's the kind of due diligence or compliance which they can preemptively take Uh, to prevent any of their advertisements being treated as false or misleading what what's the what's the catch there yeah so i think as a self regulatory organization uh, you know while we are very uh, established i think on the corrective action that we take uh, you know on ads that may be in potential violation of our code i think one of the big agendas we also have is how do we help the industry get it right uh, and you know uh, so it's not just about uh you know being being the cop on the other side of the signal and waiting for you to break the signal but you know how do we also educate you about traffic rules and help you understand the importance of it or you know support you in 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 that understanding so we have uh, uh you know a couple of services that we offer uh you know one is exactly as you mentioned due diligence that can be done uh, by advertisers uh, including testing of uh, technical claims and uh, you know this can be done at a pre production stage so you know at a script stage or a storyboard stage and and um, you know that that i think will allow advertisers to be more confident um, that uh, you know someone has kind of taken a look and flagged off if there are any concerns that uh, could be addressed during the production stage uh, we also offer a similar services a service for endorsers um you know where we endorsers can do this uh, similar due diligence and uh, uh, you know as you would know under the law if the endorser has done the due diligence if they can demonstrate that uh, then these uh, uh, you know penalties would be waived off uh, so that's again something that the law provides for so again uh, you know endorsers are doing due diligence and providing that evidence uh, uh, you know becomes a crucial service uh, also that uh, that we provide besides this we also have training programs that we offer to corporates so that um, uh, you know increasingly we want self regulation to work uh, not just post publication but at the point of creation um, you know and that's important that uh, you know it's not just the legal teams who have to defend these ads eventually but you know a marketer <laughs> or a creative person who's making this ad in the first place has a sense of what these regulations are and uh, you know how can we kind of Uh, go about uh, you know preventing some of these uh, things happening so i think those are the issues that you know increasingly we are uh, uh, you know working on understood so maybe if if i come to subhash and and subhash would love to hear your perspectives uh, so we have rishi's perspective but more from a broader industry perspective what are you hearing particularly with brands and advertisers how are they coping with these changes and and the changes are coming thick and fast that whether in the ASCII uh, ecosystem or in the CCPA ecosystem yeah well there are quite a few new things that are come emerging right i mean ccpa is uh, relatively very new and therefore there are a lot of questions even in the advertising industry being asked about okay so how do we navigate this what do we keep in mind and so on so forth right in some of the uh, uh, more established categories i would say things are much easier understood uh, in some of the new emerging categories uh, there are a lot of questions because the law itself is not clear like nfts and 
digital assets. There is no specific, you know, and, and, and uh, questions are being asked by the consumer, questions are being asked by the advertising industry. Uh, so some of those questions will continue. And as Rishi said, look, hopefully there'll be clarity as we go forward with more conversation. Hopefully there'll be streamlining of processes. Uh, but so far, luckily, uh, we haven't seen too many any confusion yet. That, you know, because uh, as, as Manisha had pointed out, there is a tremendous overlap between the CCPA guidelines and the ASCII guidelines, which were always there, right? And we will continue to issue sector-specific guidelines as they come along, right? Uh, till a few years back, the gaming industry was not something that necessarily uh, came up, and but we had to do it because it's become a pretty big industry. Uh, influencer marketing is growing quantum fold every year, right? Uh, and uh, where, where, uh, and in the digital medium, what is an ad and what is content? The lines are getting blurred. While on television, you never had that problem, right? Uh, in the digital world, you can put up an ad and take it off in two hours. So even before a campaign can be registered, that ad has changed. So there is a lot of challenges with newer mediums, newer platforms uh, coming up. And therefore, uh, it is extremely important uh, that, you know, as ASCII, we are not just policing the narrative, but also helping shape the narrative. And that's what I think Manisha was referring to in terms of the training programs that we're conducting, in terms of the guidelines that we're issuing. Uh, hopefully, there won't, it won't lead to confusion because there are two uh, authorities that one has to navigate through because, like I said, the laws are common. Even the ASCII guidelines are within the law, right? What, however, the CCPA has done is to bring in a higher sense of enforcement and penalty, right, which perhaps was not there, uh, even for endorsers and uh, celebrities, you know, uh, for them suddenly oh my god okay let me just protect myself from this one now earlier they used to say look i'm just a paid actor so i don't need to worry about the claims that's the brand person's problem they just saying no you are accountable because you have millions of followers believing what you say and if you are going to be the endorser of that brand then sorry you are also equally accountable uh, so these were conversations that have emerged deep Sure, but maybe if we just stick to what you just said about endorsers and, and celebrities and so on, and there's in fact a bunch of pre-registration questions that we receive, so I'll, I'll try and plug those in as well. There's a question on fairness. Is, is it really fair uh, to hold endorsers and celebrities accountable? I mean, why this entire focus? And let's assume if we are trying to go after recklessness, is, is the deterrent that Tanu explained, is it, it sounds pretty serious to me, but to, a, to an endorser or a celebrity, to what extent will it really have that in, intended effect? Your thoughts? No, I, I believe, look, India is a, India is a celebrity crazy country. Right? Uh, we are pretty crazy about our celebrities. We hero worship them, uh, whether they are cricketers or whether they are film stars. Uh, we have even temples made for them. Uh, we are pretty hungry when it comes to uh, having hero worship, our heroes out there, right? And therefore, when somebody I really hero worship comes and tells me that this product is pretty good, right? Uh, recently, there was a case where a cricketer endorsed a real estate project which never materialized and the people lost their money and therefore or they couldn't get their property on time. And therefore, you can't say uh, that it's unfair. You have the power, you have the credibility with your followers right and therefore you are accountable so all all the law says is please do your due diligence before you go out there and endorse whether on television or on digital or print or whatever that buy this product because i say so then do your due diligence before you go and make that claim i think that's basically what the problem is right uh, uh, the difference is that currently there is not too much of a distinguishing uh, thing that we have asked for clarifications on that between a celebrity who might be paid five and a half crores or 10 crores for a particular claim versus a digital influencer who might be getting 10,000 rupees to talk about a product, right? Now they are, they're all called endorsements, right? And therefore, uh, therefore the kind of penalties that, you know, might come their way should be in, uh, uh, in cognizance of the kind of earning 
that they might be having, right? So those are clarifications that are still going to happen. But but yes, and uh, even even uh, our influencer guidelines, for example, they are endorsers, right? All we are saying is because the lines between organic content and paid partnership are blurring, your your followers are there because they believe in, they have faith in, right? So if it is a paid for point that you're making, if it is a brand promoted point that you're making, transparently reveal that to your followers. Then let them make the choice of whether they want to buy the product or not, right? And the best part is when we went to actual influencers to ask their opinion on this, all the top influencers, I think this is great because it adds to our credibility and our authenticity. Right? It, it were many brands actually who didn't want <laughs> the, the, the statement to be made but i think in the long run these are things which are extremely critical and uh, i think uh, influencers going all the way up to top end celebrities need to understand their responsibility in this whole game you can't just earn crores of rupees and sit back and say look i'm just a paid actor sure I think the word digital is, is, is something which we, we do need to focus on as a part of the panel. And maybe uh, I have one for Manisha and one for Rishi, and then I can tell we're, we're borderline on time, so we'll fi- flip to the Q&A. But Manisha, how has this entire digital advertising situation impacted the role of ASCII? And uh, how are you dealing with, how is ASCII dealing with that entire challenge? Yeah, so I think it's, uh, you know, digital is a challenge for uh, all uh, regulators and self-regulators globally uh, because, uh, you know, the nature of advertising is changing. The nature of advertisers is changing because, you know, earlier it's only people who had big budgets that could go on mainstream media and advertise. But, you know, today you can pretty much advertise on your own handle. So just the sheer number of advertisers uh, and, uh, you know, and and, and the nature of those uh, advertisers has changed dramatically. Uh, Campaign durations are measured in hours and days. Uh, You know, so these are all kind of characteristics of digital uh, that make uh, any sort of monitoring uh, you know, of them a very, very challenging uh, job. Uh, and I think, you know, so therefore we also turn to technology to kind of uh, help us uh, do this. So, uh, you know, we've deployed, uh, you know, uh, now artificial intelligence based uh, monitoring software. Uh, you know, so we, we are also having to take the help of technology uh, and become much more agile, uh, much more real time. Uh, you know, in the way that we monitor uh, things and and therefore the use of technology to kind of help us navigate the digital space. Uh, Of course, having said that, I think uh, from time to time, we will have to prioritize certain areas because, you know, it's it's pretty much impossible to, uh, you know, police the entire web and all the kind of uh, content and ads that are going there. But yes, I think from time to time, we assess uh, what are uh, emerging threats? Uh, what are big threats to consumer safety and to, um, uh, you know, to, to consumers from an advertising point of view? And I think we will kind of focus on those sectors or on those platforms or on those formats, uh, you know, that, uh, that that are big. So, for example, when we did the influencer, um, you know, guidelines and, and you know, even the whole uh, investment in, in a software to track influencers because, you know, that's now increasingly becoming a mainstream uh, spend for advertisers. Um, and also the consumer vulnerability is high there because influencers are much more trusted uh, than, let's say, brands on their own handle. So, you know, that, that kind of creates uh, additional vulnerability on, on uh, you know, from a consumer point of view. So, uh, you know, so that made it a priority for us to kind of uh, look at certain sectors. Uh, but yes, I think, uh, you know, digital will continue to be a big focus for us. And I think digital also kind of uh, brings us back to the earlier point that we were making that, you know, policing will become demonstrative uh, and symbolic. Uh, You know, the real action needs to come in the good old preventive kind of uh, space, uh, you know, and and efforts on education, efforts on creating awareness, efforts on creating a culture of responsibility in the industry, uh, you know, which which alone, I think, in the long run run is is a more sustainable solution. Um, because, uh, as I mentioned, I mean, there is no entity uh, anywhere in the world that can monitor the entire uh, volume of advertising that's that's out there. Uh, Rishi, one last question on the panel, and then I want to flip to Q&A. So just on digital, and, and 
I think your sector is 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 the most I, I would say the most direct and connected with the with the consumer. So for the FMCG sector, to what extent does digital advertising introduce a whole new world of changes? Absolutely. Again, um, uh, again, so, so direct to consumer, you would have heard D2C. And during lockdown, I think all of us have experienced these ads coming on personal care, new brands coming up in terms of food and coffee and those kind of things. Some of them have, be, have, have benefited immensely. So without needing too much capital, they can bring their product to the market, direct to the consumer. Um, but that has a flip side as well. So especially in terms of for personal care, influencers, uh, pushing things in a manner which is not really, I mean, it, it, that, that would not, I mean, it, it, so, 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 so the good thing is the compliance is easy now. ASCII has guidelines. The new consumer protection also has clear guidelines uh, in terms of what to say, what not to say, the sort of quantity, quality. Comparative advertisement is again quite simple nowadays. Now, despite all of those, digital still throws a challenge because it's so easy to push a product through an influencer. I mean, very often we come across these Instagram, I mean, ch children sort of literally ch child influencers trying to push a product, which I mean, I don't know where, what to do. Uh, and it, it, it will be a challenge. And I'm quite happy, quite pleased to hear what Manisha said. There are artificial intelligence sort of based software programs, which will help in policing. I, I think this is a frontier, which we, it's a, it's a, we all need to sort of watch the space, see how this gets regulated. Understood. Okay, uh, excellent. Thank you, everybody. I think that panel uh, has gone well. We, we, we've gone through the topics we had thought we would like to cover. Uh, I'm conscious we don't have the entire scheduled time for Q&A, but there's been a buzz of Q&A as we can all see. So, Aaron, if I can request you to pull the slide deck back and uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll start with, um, I will try and bundle a few questions so uh, we cover as much ground as we can. And maybe Nishad, if I can come back to you, this is your pet peeve, which is comparative advertising. There are a couple of different questions on that. So for everything from, from pharmaceuticals to medical devices to the cola wars, uh, people want to understand when does comparative advertising become a problem and what is really the thin line uh, people are walking on? Yes. So comparative advertising has <coughs> normally been the subject matter of common law taught. Okay. Uh, there's not really been so much regulation vis-a-vis comparative advertising under statute. Though the Consumer Protection Act talks about the fact that you cannot disparage uh, products, the rule is that you can compare uh, products, no difficulty there. However, the thumb rule is that you must focus on your product. You must portray the features of your product. And what you should not do is show down another product. Now, Comparison feature to feature is permitted. Uh, so, for example, when you are comparing two bulbs, for example, five lumens versus eight lumens, fantastic. But his product is therefore bad, does not give you light, mine gives you light, not permissible. So, most often, you know, these cases are decided on the facts of that case. There has been significant amount of litigation in the space of comparative advertising, and I've been fortunate enough to be a part of most of those, or I think all of those before the Bombay High Court at least. And what the court also looks at often is it looks at the advertisement not only in the context of one feature, but it looks at it holistically. It looks at what is the message that you are sending to the consumer, and what would an average consumer of normal intelligence perceive that advertisement <clears throat> to be? What is the message that is being given? You know, uh, so to answer the question in uh, one simple uh, sentence, comparative advertisement is permitted. You can probably puff your products. The, the, the claims that you make should be honest and truthful. You can puff it to a particular extent, to the extent that the consumer will understand that it is in fact puffing and will not take it to be an actual claim. Otherwise, it must be honest. And when you are comparing, 
do not show down the product of another the moment you do that you are going to be in trouble whichever way you do it it does not have to be spoken words it can also be just innuendos or hand gestures saying mm, not good you know perfect perfect no, i think that's 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 very that's very instructive um uh, maybe rishi just a question which uh, perhaps you'd like to take that when you're looking to engage a celebrity or an influencer or an endorser what sort of comfort would you give them as a principle uh, that all is well hand on heart all is well please don't worry so uh, we would uh, again uh, we would not make the influencer sort of uh, cross the line uh, and uh, the objective is keep it simple keep it personal like what does the influencer personally feel about using our product uh, and leave it at that do not sort of go beyond what a common man would sort of behave in that particular manner we we we've, we've done quite a bit of that as well um, let's not, we don't want to stretch it any more than what would be normal and reasonable in that sort of, in that story context I think that's perfect. Um, I'll pick two last questions and I'll open them to Manisha Subhash. Please pick them in, in whichever uh, way you would like. So one is there's a question from the digital advertising world and they're saying, is it possible for the digital advertising companies to work together with ASCII, uh, support them in guidelines and policy development? What, what's, uh, what's the kind of uh, welcome mat over there for them? Anisha, do you want to say this or do you want me to take it? Yeah, go ahead, Subhash. I think one of the things that Manisha and I both worked very hard over the last two years to establish is a very collaborative way of working. Uh, we have involved the industry. We have involved stakeholders uh, in almost all our discussions. And before we came out with guidelines, right? Uh, for the influencer guidelines, for example, we got influencers influencer management companies uh, client side creative industry side and civic society and people to talk about uh, and give their inputs to us before we even drafted the guidelines right so it's a very collaborative process uh, so very happy to hear if digital there are digital companies who want to come and have a conversation with ASCII and input into and brainstorm with us and uh, look we are a we are an industry body so absolutely welcome uh, anybody reaching out to us uh, we have done that now even in the gaming industry business guidelines we, we did that for the crypto we're doing that for almost everything we're making it very very collaborative and welcome inputs from our industry partners so specific to that point digital companies by all means please come and join us you know you know we'll create a think tank before we do anything and you're welcome to join the think tank manisha Yeah, absolutely. So I, I mean, you know, we we would welcome the expertise of uh, people who are working in the domain, both in terms of, uh, you know, the expertise, but also in terms of the practical, uh, uh, you know, ways in which uh, regulations can be implemented uh, and monitored. So I think we would uh, really welcome their comments and inputs. Great. I think I've just received a note from the organizers. I think we're at the end of our uh, webinar today. Um, so. I can just request uh, Aaron to flip to the next slide, please. Or maybe we stick with the earlier one. Sorry, maybe I just want to um, just want to thank our panelists uh, for sharing their experience and expertise with us today. Um, it, it's really been a wonderful, wonderful webinar to discuss the changes to all of these new laws. And Subhash. Manisha, Rishi, thank you so very much. Without you, this webinar would just not have been. Uh, I think an outstanding job uh, to bring the industry perspectives to this discussion. And uh, Nishad and Tanu, thanks to you, Adieu, as well, for the absolutely slick presentation up top. And good luck with what lies ahead with these new regulations. And a special thanks to Mondak for partnering with us for this Maki event. And to our audience, I hope you found the webinar interesting and a worthwhile investment of your time. We certainly enjoyed bringing it to you. 
Um, you will also separately receive a request for your feedback from the webinar. Uh, please do take a minute uh, to fill out the form and send us your feedback. The comments, criticism, compliments, everything is welcome. Uh, and please do not hesitate to contact us regarding any matters arising from this webinar. Our contact information is on the slide in front of you. Uh, thank you for your attendance today, and we look forward to being of service again at future webinars. Thank you, everybody, and have a lovely evening ahead. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye.